Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, let's go. I had to wait for that light to come on. And uh, again, we want to thank every one of you here for coming in this afternoon for another session of taping. We've got folks visiting from Minnesota, from Idaho, and uh, all the rest of you, of course, are pretty much old hand. But uh, for those of you out in television, if you're just catching our program for the first time, we always like to emphasize that we're not associated with any one large group. I'm not a pastor of a church. Don't ever write and say, Dear Reverend or Dear Pastor, because that's not true. I'm, uh, I'm a layman, and the Lord has just given us these opportunities to teach the Word only for the purpose that you learn how to do it on your own. As one young man called from Tennessee just the other day, and he said, Les, he was 26, he said, Les, up until this point in time, I just sat in church with my arms crossed them on my chest and just took whatever came from the pulpit to be the truth. But he said, your program on radio, uh, made me realize that that wasn't always true. So he said, I started getting into the book on my own and I found out that most of what I was hearing across that pulpit was not true, that it was false. And so this is what we want people to do. Not go by what I say, don't go by what some preacher or evangelist says, go by what the Word of God says. Because as I mentioned, I think in the last taping, if Tyndale thought the Word of God should be in the hands of every plowboy in England, now, England plowboys were not seminary graduates. <laughs> they were fortunate to just simply be able to read, and yet that's all it takes, because the Spirit of God will open the Bible to the understanding of anyone if you'll prayerfully look for it. So that's our purpose, to just get people to study the Word on their own. Again, we always want to thank our television audience for your tremendous letters your prayer support, your financial support, because without it we could never stay on the air. And uh, we just can never thank you enough. Okay, now we're ready to move on and we're going to pick right up where we've left off in our last series of, of uh, lessons. And we're still going to be in the same verse, but we're going to move on to the last half of it now today and then move on to some of the other but gods and but Christ and so forth uh, throughout the New Testament. All right, so if you'll come back with me where we've been now for the last several weeks or months, whatever the case may be, in Matthew chapter 6, and we've been on verse 33, but we're going to go on now to the last half of the verse. But, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And that's why we've still got the circles on the board. The kingdom of God is that area of God's influence and control that are on the righteous side and not of the things that pertain to to the unrighteous. They are not in the kingdom of God. But within the kingdom of God, we have discerned for the last several programs that there are two other entities. The kingdom of heaven, which has been promised to Israel since especially the Abrahamic covenant, and involving all the other covenants after that, the Davidic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, and the new covenant, they're all associated with this kingdom of heaven. And then when Israel rejected all that for the time being and at the stoning of Stephen, God did something totally different that was kept secret from all the generations and as Paul calls it, the revelation of the mysteries and that is the opening up of the church age or the calling out of the body of Christ. And we've been just defining that now for the last several programs. All right, now we're going to move on to the last half of the verse where he says, and all these things things, the material things that he listed up above this, how that the lilies of the field don't have to worry about how they're dressed. We don't have to worry as believers, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Because that's all under his divine provision. All right, so if we seek first the kingdom of God, become a member of, for us today, the body of Christ, then we can rest assured that God will take care of all of our needs and bless us as he sees fit. Now we have to remember God does not promise two cars in every garage. He does not promise three homes. He doesn't promise a million dollar bank account. All He promises is our daily needs. That's what we're promised. Everything that's beyond that is by the grace of God. If He's seen fit to bless, bless some of us, or some of you, I guess I should say, with, with wealth or with an abundance, it isn't because you've earned it. It isn't because it's, you became a believer. It's because God's grace has permitted it. That's all, as far as we can go. 
but he does promise to fulfill all our needs. But now this is Old Testament yet, remember, even though it's in the Gospels. So we're going to look at how this was established by Old Testament credentials that these things, material things, shall be added unto you. And let us take verse 34 as well. So he says, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now until the middle of the night last night, I still didn't really have a handle on what I was going to use from the Old Testament. And I woke up at 3 o'clock and it hit me like a ton of bricks, as we say. Psalms chapter 1. Let's go back and look at it. And it's a, verse, a chapter that I learned when I was a kid in Bible school. And so I didn't have to get up and go read what the text said. I knew what it said. Blessed is the man. Psalms chapter 1. Now these are some of the things that I think Jesus was referring to his Jewish readers or listeners concerning the things that are appropriate now for the child of God, even in the Old Testament economy. And this is a beautiful chapter. Psalms chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Blessed, or we can say today, happy, is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So where is this gentleman? He's in the kingdom of God. He's a believer. And of course, I think it's David. All right? Nor does he stand in the way of sinners. He's not outside the kingdom of God. He's in it. So he has no concourse with the unbelieving world. Nor does he sit in the seat of the scornful, ridiculing things that are spiritual. He's a man of God. He appreciates knowing God. He appreciates the blessings of God. Now verse 2. Now remember, this is Old Testament. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Now for the Old Testament believer, what was this law? Well, the Ten Commandments. They reveled in it. The Ten Commandments were their staff of life, as it should be. And you see, that's what Moses saw would one day disappear, not realizing how and when, but now we know that when the finished work of the cross came into being, and we are now saved by grace, not by law, the Ten Commandments have disappeared. But for the Old Testament believer, it was at the core of his understanding of the things of God. All right, read on. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now this is the Old Testament believer. All right, read on. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither. And then the physical part or the material part for the believer is whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now, of course, that was Old Testament constantly, that if a Jewish believer was obedient and he was faithful, he could expect material blessings. We don't have those kind of promises today. We don't have to say, well, God, I'm a believer. I'm doing what you want me to do. Where are my prosperity blessings? No, that's not promised today. But for the Old Testament believer, it was. Now, I couldn't help but think also of a, of a vivid experience that Iris and I had a few years ago. We were having seminars out in New Mexico. And if you remember a few years ago, they had tremendous drought and forest fires out there. And I'll never forget, we had gone from Roswell down to Elephant Butte, and from Elephant Butte we were going to go up to Albuquerque, and we were on high ground, and when you looked way down, there was this golden bordered river. I was in the fall, and the aspens and the cottonwoods were just as yellow as Susie's blouse over there. But they were only for a few feet away from the river. The rest was absolute desert. But the river of water kept those trees alive and beautiful. That's the life of the believer. See, our tap roots go right into the very blessings of God, even in the Old Testament. All right, so it's a good analogy that as you watch the trees along the river, how they are constantly fed from the waters that are not come and go like in a drought season on the rest of the land around it. And that's the believer. Even in the Old Testament, he shall be like a tree planted by a river of water, and then his leaf will not wither, and then the promise, as I've already said to the Old Testament believer was, that whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. 
Now, of course, David sometimes had some problems with that, didn't he? Now, stay here. I'm going to come back. Uh, these are portions that come to mind while I'm teaching, so forgive me. Come up to chapter 37. 37. And this, too, is a psalm of David. But this is looking at the other side of the coin. Sometimes it's the world that appears to have their taproot in the river water. And David had a problem with it, as we do. Even today, we look around, we say, why do the ungodly prosper? Why do they seemingly just have everything going their way? Well, that's typical. See, now look how David puts it. Psalms 37, verse 1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Why? For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Now, have you certainly noticed that wealthy people die just as fast as the poor people do? You know, always have to come back to the founder of Walmart. My, you would have thought that when they diagnosed his first cancer with all of his billions, he'd make it. But did he? No. He went right on like everybody else. And all that wealth couldn't cure his cancer. All right, now look at the next one. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily shalt thou be fed. Now, you see how Old Testament this is? This is a promise to David in the land of promise under the blessings of Jehovah God. All right? Verse 5. This is a verse that I usually refer to people who are going through adversity. It's just as applicable to us today as it was for David 2000, no, 1000 B.C., 3000 years ago. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He, the Lord, will bring it to pass. That is, the things that are according to His will. It's a beautiful promise. Now verse 6. He shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday, that is, righteous judgment. Verse 7. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. See what he's driving at? Don't get all shook up by the ungodly person who's making it over and over and over. Nothing ever seems to go against them. Don't worry about that. He's getting all the heaven he's ever going to have here on earth. And then the rest is eternal doom. And so this is what David is saying here. Fret not for the one who is doing the ungodly things. All right, then finishing the verse, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass, cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Now here it is. For evil doers shall be cut off. When this life is over, it's all done for them. But for the believer, now read on, they, those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the what? earth. So what does that tell you? This is Old Testament. See that? You don't always have to go back. I, I bet I share it, I don't know how many times a week with people, and they say, well, when, how did you see all this? How did you see rightly dividing the Scripture, the difference between God dealing with Israel and God dealing with the church? I said, it goes back to when I first started outside of my denominational Sunday school class, and a lady came up and just bombarded me, about blew me away with one question. Iris and I were talking about it at breakfast this morning. And the question was, why isn't heaven taught in the Old Testament? Well, I'd never dreamed of such a question. It had never crossed my mind. And I told her so. I said, never heard of such a thing. Well, she says, it's not back there. So I had to look and look and look some more. And she was right. Because they weren't looking about dying and going to heaven. They were looking to die and go into this earthly kingdom. And here it is. Even in David's psalm, that was their hope and their prospect that, you know, I always go back to Job 19. How did Job put it? I know that my Redeemer liveth, and in the latter days shall stand on the portals of heaven. No, where? On the earth. And in my flesh, in a resurrected body, Job says, I will see him. Well, what was he talking about? 
the earthly kingdom, just like David is referring to here in Psalms 37. He's not talking about heaven. He's talking about the earthly kingdom that's still going to be Israel's eternal abode. All right, let's just go back to the earth, uh, verse 9 a minute. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth when Christ sets up his kingdom. All right, back to chapter 1. Back to chapter 1, we're still looking at how the Old Testament saints could realize the physical and the earthly blessings that were promised them beyond the spiritual. All right, back to Psalms 1, verse 4. Now here's the comparison again. The ungodly, those that are outside this kingdom of God, the ungodly are not so but they are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Now, you've got to remember that Israel was an agricultural, agrarian society. And so most of their language is in that direction. Now, a lot of metropolitan people don't know the difference between grain and chaff, but we're in a rural area of the country, and hopefully you all do. What's chaff? Well, it's that outer shuck that holds the kernel of wheat or whatever it may be. All right, it's worthless, has no feed value, has nothing. And so as they go through those fields with those huge combines and you see that cloud of dust going up behind, what's blowing away? Well, the chaff, it's worthless. And the grain remains, goes up into the tank. All right, now this is a biblical analogy. The ungodly in all his deeds are just like that worthless chaff that blows away into oblivion. And they will come to the end of their days on earth and they're going to go on into a lost eternity. They've had all the heaven they're ever going to have while they're enjoying their wealth and their riches here. All right, now verse 5. Therefore, sounds like Paul, doesn't it? Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. Now the judgment here does not mean punishment. It means righteous government. I'm always pointing that out, that the word judgment in the Old Testament does not mean punishment. It means a righteous government. All right, so the ungodly shall not stand under that righteous government of the earthly kingdom, nor will sinners sit in the congregation of the righteous. They're going to be separated out. They're not going to have any part in it. You know, that reminds me of something else. You know, this is why I love to teach. I love the way things can be flip-flop back and forth and they all flit. Fit. Now, when you get into Matthew, two women shall be at the, at the mill grinding, one taken, the other left. Now, there's still a lot of confusion across Christendom. Well, what's it talking about? Well, the unbeliever will be taken because the kingdom is about ready to come in. And so the believer of those two will be left. Two, bed, two shall be sleeping in the bed, one taken, the other left. Who's taken? The unbeliever because the kingdom is about to come in and only believers will go in. All right, you got the same analogy here, see? For uh, the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The ungodly aren't going into the kingdom economy. They're going to go to their eternal doom. It's just as much a teaching for Old Testament as it is for the new. Well, I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to cover everything that Paul says now that would fit for that to seek first the kingdom of God, that, of course, to become a member of the body of Christ. And I've shown that for the last several programs. All right, but now what is beyond the spiritual, the material? All right, now let's go up to the New Testament again, and let's look at how Paul puts it. And, of course, there's no better letter of Paul to start when it comes to the things of, of joy and blessing than Philippians. A little letter to the Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. And we're going to jump in at chapter 4. Oh, goodness. There's so much here again. Let's back up to chapter 3, honey. Back up to chapter 3. Let's jump in at uh, verse 12. No, let's go to verse 10. Let's go to verse 10. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 10. Now, this, of course, the apostle writing from the first person. 
but as he says over and over, be ye followers of me as I follow Christ. So these could also be our words. Philippians 3, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Here's where our identity of his death, burial, and resurrection comes to the fore. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Now, in so many words, he's just saying that Paul was stopped on the road to Damascus. God saved him in an instant. But for what purpose? To be the apostle of Gentiles, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. All right, now it's the same way for every one of us. We're not just saved as a fire escape. We're not just saved to escape hell fire. We are saved to spend the rest of our life, whenever it is, long or short, in His service, whatever it may be. And it may be some others, some less and others more, but nevertheless, we're saved to dedicate our life to service, even as the apostle did. All right, now then, verse 14. He pressed forward or toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, what's he talking about? Well, you see, after we have attained salvation in this age of grace, now we don't work to complement salvation. We work now for what? Reward. We're going to be rewarded in glory. I don't know what they're going to be. Let God be the judge. But I know this, that for the faithful believer, there are rewards that are piling up that we're going to enjoy for all eternity. Well, the Apostle Paul was in that same state. Now, of course, he suffered and served more than any thousands of us will do. But it's the same picture that as he labored and as he suffered, it wasn't to gain salvation. He had that, but it was for reward, for the crowns that are going to be laid at the Lord's feet. All right, now then, let's come on into our own situation. Verse 15, let us therefore, as many as be perfect or have become spiritually mature, let us be thus minded, and if anything you be otherwise minded, God shall relieve you, reveal even this to you. Let God lead. You know, someone asked the other day how I got to this place. And I said, well, I'll tell you one thing. I never put the first foot forward. Never did I do make a move to try to accomplish what we're doing. God always opened the door first, and then we were obedient to walk through. And all the way up until this present time, I can honestly say I have never made the first move. God does. And so I think I can share this with all of you. Don't necessarily feel that you've got to be out there pushing to get something done. Just be willing that when it does come, that you're going to do what God wants you to do. All right. Verse 16. Nevertheless, Whereto we have already attained, let us walk with the same rule, let us mind the same thing. And then verse 17. Now this is portions of Paul that a lot of people detest. They think he should have said, follow Jesus. No, he doesn't say that. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. All right, verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them who walk as you have us for an example, for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and I'll tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, that's powerful language. They're not true believers. My, I had a letter yesterday I told ours. I wish I could share it, but I can't. But, oh, it is so typical of what's going on even in Christian circles today where they've got the attitude that just because they've gone through the motions of being saved, they are now free to do whatever they want to do. I don't have to worry. I'm once saved, always saved. And I wish I could share the letter, but it was too explicit. But listen, you and I cannot take that attitude. Paul condemned that kind of thinking in Romans, and he, he decried it. Just because we're under grace doesn't mean that we can do whatever we want to do and then say, oh, I don't have to worry. I'm safe. Baloney. That's not true. 
And so here again, see, we have all these people that seemingly are saying the right things, are doing the right things, but what are they? They're enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? Well, there's a multitude of reasons, but mostly because they're not spirit-led. They're doing it in the flesh. All right, only got two minutes left. Then come back to verse 19. Whose end is not eternal glory, it's not reward, it's what? Destruction. Whose God is their belly. In other words, all they're really thinking of are the material things. And whose glory is in their shame, who mind what? Earthly things. That's all they're living for. But under the, how shall I put it? Under the whatever of being spiritual. But they're not. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. All right, now then, I think I'll just go on and finish the chapter. We've probably covered it in our daily program, and it never hurts to repeat it. Let's just finish the chapter in minutes left. For our citizenship is in heaven. We do not mind earthly things first and foremost, because our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's, of course, the blessed hope for the believer, that we think that maybe today, maybe tonight, tomorrow, next week, sometime soon we trust the Lord's coming. He's going to call us out. And Paul was already looking for it in his day. Now then, verse 21, And when he comes, who shall change our vile body, this body that's prone to sickness and disease and injury, and this body is going to be fashioned like unto His glorious body. I always tell people, all you have to do is just study the 40 days of Christ after His resurrection until He was ascended, and you'll get a vivid description of the kind of a body we're going to have for eternity. He could be one place, one instant, and way up the road in the next. He could eat and He could drink with the eleven. He could converse with them but he could go through a wall without a door or a window. It was a body that was fit for eternity, and we're going to have one just like it. What a blessed hope. All right, so he's going to be giving us a body like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Why? Because he is the creator God of everything. Even though he loved us and gave himself for us, never forget. He was the eternal Creator God. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.